Hello and uh, welcome to Azure Serverless Conf. Today I will be talking about event sourcing and I will be expressing event sourcing using Azure serverless technologies like Cosmos DB and Azure Functions. So what is, the, uh, what is it that I'll be talking about? I will be discussing you know, what is event sourcing and you know, the basics of that. And then we will kind of look at a um, implementation of event sourcing using Azure Functions and Azure Cosmos DB in a serverless mode. And I'll do that with the help of a demo. This is me. Um, I'm a consultant at Microsoft. And if uh, you want to talk to me further about this talk, feel free to reach out at that LinkedIn um, link. So let's start off with what is event sourcing, because without that, it's going to be really hard to uh, you know, talk about what we are doing here. As Martin Fowler describes it, event sourcing is a data pattern. This data pattern ensures that all the changes to any application state are stored as a sequence of events. So what he's saying is that the, instead of storing data, you're storing events. And then he's also saying that you can use these events to reconstruct the past, past state. So these are some of the concepts that we'll be touching on in today's talk. So before getting started, you know, we talk about these uh, data patterns and technologies, but we want to know what problems that, you know, that it is that these solve. So the number one problem is with you know relational databases and CRUD, you know these systems perform update operations directly against a data store. So you know CRUD operations are directly run against the same data store, which means that you're reading and writing from the same data store. This can cause a you know, bunch of you know slowdown in performance, slowdowns in responsiveness. It limits scalability. And it has a lot of processing overhead because the same system is handling both reads and writes. You know, coming back to the you know CRUD against the same systems in a collaborative domain with many concurrent users, the data updates conflicts are more likely. This is because the same update operation takes place on a single item of data. So think about this: you are trying to read a record while trying to update it at the same time. These type of transactions often lock the data, leading to data storage issues due to transaction lock. Another, another kind of downside of this type of architecture is that we, uh, you know, uh, with the CRUD systems, we can query an application state and we can find out the current state of the data. And this definitely answers many questions. For instance, you know, I want to look at the st status of an order I placed online, and it gives me the current state. But there are times that I want to go back and look at something like the, you know, track my order to see how it got to my place or where it's at currently. And when, when is it expected to get here? I can make some extrapolations based on where it's at to, to figure out when it can get here. So you know, there are times that we just don't want to see where we are currently, but we also want to know how we got here so that in the future, we may be able to extrapolate where we can go. So that type of... Uh, uh, those type of operations become really hard with CRUD-based systems unless you explicitly uh, like write separate code to handle those. And auditing, uh, you know, in these days, especially with different things like GDPR and data compliance, auditing of data is a really important issue. But unless there is an additional auditing mechanism that records the details of each operation in a CRUD system, there is, you know, the history is lost. So there's no inbuilt auditing trail. So these are some of the problems that event sourcing tries to solve. And how does it do that? 
event sourcing, uh, in, uh, instead of storing the data, just the current state of the data in a domain, it uses it uses an append only store. And the append only store is used to record the full series of actions taken on that data. So these are a series of events that is sent by the application code. And each action, just uh, each event corresponds to each action that occurred on the data. And each event represents a set of changes to that data. This data is sent to the event store where it's persisted. So this event store basically stores all, all these events. So it, it's kind of a data store, right? So you have events or events as data, and this data is stored in a database. So you know, you're basically storing the events as data. And this is your system of record, aka the source of truth. And this is a source of truth about the current state of data. So if you take the data in here, it should, it should have all the events that happened until now. What next? The event store publishes these events so that uh, you know, consumers can be notified. And these consumers handle the events as they see fit. So you know, think of it like, you know, uh, let's say I'm doing a grocery order and I, you know, as soon as I place the order, someone uh, like a, you know, in the grocery delivery service, the person doing the shopping may be notified that our order is ready. So, so similar to that, you know, every time an event happens, it gets published and then it gets handled by either external systems or you can take that data and use materialize it to look at the data in further detail or in further summary. So consumers can initiate tasks that apply the operations in this event to other systems, and they can perform other associated action that, uh, that's required to complete the operation. The application code, it's worth noting that the application code that generates the events is separate from the application code that subscribes to this event. So there's a strong decoupling happening between the incoming and the outgoing, which, which makes scalability really helpful. And it's what it's the, it, talking about the consumers. So you know, typical uses of the events published by the event store are, you know, you can maintain a materialized view of entities. And these materialized view of entities take the actions and they, they combine them together in some sort of format that's easy to consume, uh, either by a UI or by reports or something else. Um, for instance, a system can have a materialized view of all the customer orders. Uh, that, and this can be used to populate the UI. Also, as the application orders, adds new orders or removes items uh, and adds shipping information, uh, these events can, uh, this, uh, the events that describe these changes, they can be handled by the published events and used to update the materialized view. The, the advantage to the materialized view is it gives an extremely fast look up for the data without having to go through operations like joining tables and other things. So it's it's really fast look up. And finally, replaying events. Uh, it's possible to, since this stores all the events, all you have to do is go back, go back in and replay these events. Additionally, these events are stored in order, which means that uh, you can, when you replay these events, it'll actually give you a frame by frame play of how you got to a particular state. So that makes this really powerful. So let's now talk about the implementation of event sourcing in Azure. So, you know, today we'll do a simple event sourcing example. And to do this, we'll use 
Azure Serverless Technologies. And we'll talk about why serverless, but uh, you know, it's worth talking about the technologies themselves. The first one is Cosmos DB. Uh, Azure Cosmos DB, of course, as you know, is Microsoft's globally distributed multi-model NoSQL database as a service. Now, Azure Cosmos DB, which is indicated on the screen, uh, is great for append only operations, which is what our event stores re require. So Azure Cosmos DB, uh, because of its nature, it's uh, great when it's used in situations like read only or write only. And in this case, it's largely write only. So th that makes it great for this use case. Uh, additionally, Azure Cosmos DB has flexible schema, which means that if your operations, um, if the incoming events happen to change format ever so slightly, keep in mind, not major changes, but, you know, flexible, like, you know, you may have like a card created event in a slightly different format compared to the item added event. So as long as, you know, they are similar schema, but different, Cosmos DB can handle them very well. Uh, we will be using Cosmos DB in a serverless mode, which means that we will, we don't have to worry about uh, provisioning throughput and other maintenance related items. So Cosmos DB, you know, it'll just scale up and down as needed. Which brings me to another point: the uh, the fact that you know, Cosmos DB is uh, in serverless mode. It's really good at handling unpredictable traffic. So event sourcing systems by their very nature tend to be spiky. So you, you, know, you, you get like, uh, suddenly you get a stream of events and then it goes quiet for a while and you get another stream of events. So event sourcing system, uh, due to unpredictable traffic, you know, it's hard to uh, predict what type of provisioning what type of throughput needs to be provisioned for things like Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB in the serverless mode works really well in this case. The, uh, the adv other advantage is that it charges only for storage at the times that it's inactive. Which brings me to the next component that I'll be, uh, next Azure technology that I'll be using as a component of the event sourcing system, Azure Function. So I'll be using Cosmos DB as a data store, and I'll be reading and processing the uh, events using Azure Functions. Again, Azure, I'll be using Azure Functions in a serverless or consumption mode. The advantages of uh, Azure Functions are very well known. Uh, you don't need to provision or manage any servers. This eliminates the need for most plumbing code. and Azure, Azure Functions reacts to events and conditions. That's its primary, uh, you know, Azure Function has triggers and, you know, these triggers are basically events. So it reacts really well to those so event sourcing. It becomes, you know, a very good fit for this type of implementing this type of data pattern. Uh, it has very low TCO, which is total cost of operation, uh, which means that uh, Azure Functions only charges com for compute when it's actually operating. And when it's not um, executing, it doesn't charge for anything. So that makes it really cost effective. And because you're not having to maintain any servers and all of those, the total cost of operation becomes really low. Uh, the Azure Functions is really good at executing short snippets of code which are easy to test, easy to reuse. It's a fully managed uh, service, server management, capacity planning, and uh, others, you know, sundry items are invisible to the developer. So the next question is, how do we tie the pieces together? This brings me to a feature of Cosmos DB called Change Feed. Change Feed is one of the, you know, features of Cosmos DB that's I feel like it deserves to be used more and it you know more needs to be said about this. It's a fantastic feature. It's like a RSS feed for change 
in Cosmos DB data. So anytime there are data changes, this actually publishes, this kind of publishes to the change feed and from where it can be picked up. Uh, what, how change feed works is it listens to changes on a container, uh, listens for changes and when changes happen, it outputs this list of, because you know, uh, Cosmos DB stores document, it outputs a sorted list of documents. And obviously sorted list means it's an order, which makes it really good for event sourcing, which is really particular about the order of data, or order of events. Also, uh, Azure Functions, have something called bindings, and the bindings allow them to listen to the change feed. So all of this means that you know, the amount of code, glue code you write for one service to talk to another becomes really low. So this makes it really powerful. The collection being listened to is called the monitored collection, and you will see that we also have something called a lease collection that needs to be present in Cosmos DB so that the change feed works. Uh, what is the lease collection used for? It's used to maintain the state of the change feed, um, keep track of the changes and other things, keep track, so keep track of the state and other things related to the state of the change feed. So with that, I will do a short demo. And then we will talk about the pros. We'll kind of talk about some tips and tricks uh, for working with event sourcing and you know, serverless technologies. Um, so my demo is very simple. Um, you know, I'll be uh, generating a source of events, a series of events, like you know, creating a cart, uh, viewing uh, grocery items, adding grocery items to the cart, uh, you know, removing grocery items from the cart. And then I'll also be doing a summary that kind of represents the materialized view part of the system. And that, what it'll do is it'll take each cart and calculate the total for that cart. So let's jump into the demo. So uh, the first thing I have in here is, it, this is not part of the event sourcing system, but this is simply a test harness as you can see, it has different action types. It has items and prices, and it uses a randomizer to push these onto a Cosmos DB collection. And how does it push them to Cosmos DB collection? It uh, will do that using bindings. What do bindings look like? And that's right here. So as you can see, this is uh, the binding type Cosmos DB, it has a database name, grocery delivery, collection, and uses a connection string. And the out means that anything in the code, um, the, the, the out um, variable in here gets stored into Cosmos DB. The next part of this is the actual Cosmos DB. So the Cosmos DB has three uh, uh, different I you know, databases on here. As you can see, there's a cards database that has nothing in it. There's an order database that has nothing in it. And there's the leases, and the leases is kind of used for the change feed. So what we'll do is we'll put orders, events into the order database, and then we'll read it with this process order code. And the process order code, what it's doing is it is uh, it actually has bindings. So process order code listens to the change feed. So as you can see here, it uh, uh, it uses the Cosmos DB trigger to listen to the change feed in the orders collection. And then it it uh, outputs uh, the outputs the orders to the cart. So it updates the cart. So in here, as you can see, it's uh, you know reading a series of documents. So it, it reads through these documents and it reads the properties of the uh, data that was just inputted into the orders database. And then what it's doing is it's uh, using the cart ID. It uh, checks to see if the cart exists. 
if the cart doesn't exist, it creates a new cart. And the upsert, uh, I use the upsert document, which means that it will insert or it will update, depending on whether the item exists or not. And if the cart exists, it's going to update the total. So what I'm going to do is I will go ahead and kick both of my kick off both of my functions. And you can as you can see that as they run, they will start to populate data in here. But we will get back to this in a second. We'll let this run through. And what I want to do is, uh, while this is running, I want to talk about some event sourcing tips and gotchas. Uh, you can see event sourcing, uh, the materialized views will be eventually consistent because you know uh, after it reads the data, it processes them. So it's not, uh, you, you can't expect an immediate uh, acid type operation in there. The event store should not be updated with anything else since the source of truth. The format of event changes. It's difficult to combine uh, events before and after. So just, just something to keep in mind. The consistency and order of events is vital uh, and timestamping of events is a must. If the event stream is large, consider creating snapshots uh, at intervals uh, so that you can take the current snapshot and replay events after that. Uh, this also leads into the whole Lambda architecture. Uh, and then the consumers are item potent, which means that the same operation results uh, results uh, in the same results. Uh, so the event update should not be reapplied. And finally, some serverless tips and gotchas. Cosmos DB in serverless mode is single region only. Uh, they do have availability zones for resilience. Uh, Cosmos DB in serverless can only store 50 GB of data uh, per container. Uh, this whole, uh, all the serverless technologies are really good for spikes in traffic, but if you're doing constant consumption, you may want to relook at your architecture and maybe add some other components for that. Uh, the flow of data from one component to another combined with things like cold start for functions means that you should not expect real-time response. So, you know, I talked about eventual consistency, which flows well with that. Uh, and the change feed uh, it guarantees order only within the partition key. You should use an external queuing mechanism if uh, you're looking for uh, you know, order across the board. So with that, what we're going to do is we'll go back and look at some of our uh, collections. And we will see if we're getting any data in here. So as you can see, this was empty, and now it's starting to store data. And uh, you'll see that the amount, the data slowly increases. And you can see that it's updating because this is a cart. You can see that it's uh, updating the total in the cart. So that's one thing. And then in the orders, similarly, you'll see that It's, it's adding orders to this. So you can see the number of orders slowly incrementing. So basically what's happening is that these, uh, as the uh, uh, generate data drops data into the order collection, the process order function listens to that and then it processes the data and updates the items in the cart. So that's that's a in a short overview of what it should look like. Uh, one thing I would do is uh, you can see that it's uh, you know uh, you can see that over here it's processing the data and then it's updating it. So uh, one thing I would do is you know obviously this was. Uh, even sourcing architecture with purely serverless technologies, I would consider adding something like uh, Event Hub just to make sure that uh, you get a better, uh, you know, you use the right components to handle the order of events. But other than that, I mean, this type of technology works really well with um, Azure. And, uh, the serverless technologies works really well, particularly where you want to do things like, uh, do, you know, do like uh, P 
POCs or even like you know smaller systems, the, this this and spiky behavior, this works really great. So that you know that's uh, event sourcing with uh, serverless technologies like Azure Cosmos DB and functions. Um, so if you have further questions, I'm happy to take up the discussion. Please feel free to talk to me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much.